Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to our May 2023 season finale of Soul Issue, the African American Perspective. I'm your host, Daryl Newton. The month of May is host to many events and causes across the region from Cinco de Mayo celebrations to mental health awareness, men's health awareness, May flowers, and a whole host of wonderful events and worthy causes we should be aware of. Soul Issue has decided to tackle diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, with some of our local experts. Our panel will provide their input on a recent area DEI study and discuss some of the results and how it can affect you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this diversity edition of Soul Issue, the African American Perspective. don't have to look too far to find issues in our country that hasn't affected us locally in one way or another, starting with policing, education, politics, and in with the state of race relations. Today our panel will tackle a few of these issues and suggest some real solutions and actions you can take or resolve. Now's the time and this is the place to start looking for the solutions to many of those issues. Let's start the conversation on how your community work together to collectively solve them. I am excited uh, with our guest today and uh, esteemed colleagues. We're having the conversation on DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So without further ado, let's just jump right into the conversation. And not to put any of you on the spot, what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean to you? And uh, uh, in your relative positions uh, from an education standpoint and a community standpoint. Let's start, start with you, Dr. Gavin. Um, so each of those words has different meaning, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Diversity is, um, for me, bare minimum of representation of different kinds of people, whether it's their racial demographics, their uh, class background, religious, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, equity is a state of being where your outcomes for people yeah. are similar the, no matter what uh, those demographics may be, which requires significant systemic change. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, you know, at, at Delta College, as well as all community colleges throughout the country, we're not serving certain groups of people, especially, specifically African-American males as well mm -hmm. um, as others, and I use that language intentionally. Sure. The institutions are not serving those people well. Mm -hmm. um, and inclusion is a, a feeling that, you know, this is a place where you belong. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that takes, uh, to, to truly live those values, I think, yeah. is something that requires radical transformation and is not just uh, uh, buzzwords on a yeah. page. So um, I, to, in, for sake of time, I'll sort of close there, but those are what those words mean to me. Sure. Uh, Dr. Uh, McLean, how about you? I, I like the word belonging, but what does it mean to you uh, in, your, in your capacity and what you do here at Delta College? Well, as the Chief Officer of Culture, Belonging, and Community Building, those words are really important for me because they are at the core of the work that I do here. I think the challenge for us is that academics keep um, challenging us to think differently about how we live together. And so diversity means difference. It's just a part of the human condition to have differences. But for such a long time, Marginalized groups were saying, treat me the same. So now there's a focus on respect me, even with my differences. So also when you think about inclusion, inclusion is not synonymous with integration. For a long time, we wanted integration, but integration does not sure inclusion, having an equal opportunity and equal access. And then the last one, equity, of course, people weren't marching and saying, we want equity. <laughs> they were saying, we want equality. Yes. So getting people's heads around the fact that equity is not always equal, however, it is fair and it is just, that's the challenge of our gen generation. And Diane Mahoney, um, with Bay Area Community Foundation, yes. what does that mean to you being a community partner and uh, a proponent and a proponent of the new study, which we'll get into shortly. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? So I, I concur with both 
um, of your comments and would say that from a community foundation, from the perspective of the community foundation, it is really about building that sense of belonging in the community where every voice is heard. We're not trying to get everyone to think the same way or do the same thing. We're trying to build an appreciation for the uniqueness of, of the human condition. Okay. Um, is that important to the viability of, uh, say, for example, uh, an educational institution or a community? Is it? Because is, is, some think that it's just another form of affirmative action or something to that effect. And you do have those out there that just say, well, you know, everything is good, but why should someone else need diversity and equity and inclusion? What are your thoughts on that? Me? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually think it's the foundation of the democratic experiment. Um, we make these promises that everybody's going to have the same access and opportunity. Mm -hmm. And you either believe in that or you don't. Yeah. I, I think it's very simple. Um, so. It, it is important from an educational aspect because mm -hmm. I think education provides that access to a better life. But I think that arguments against diversity and inclusion are actually very anti-democratic. Um, and I don't mean that in a way to be sure. pejorative or negative that mm -hmm. are pe to people who are thinking through these issues, but it's just very simple. You either believe that all are equal and deserve the same kind of chance and to remove the barriers to allow people to get that, sure. or you don't. And I think it's, it's people make it um, a little more difficult than it has to be. Sure. Dr. McClain. I, I think it's essential to our collective well-being. I think that the problem is that a lot of people think of DEI as if it's a gift to others, whether, rather than thinking of it as a gift to all of us. Sure. If you could erase history and take away all of the contributions of women, all of the contributions of people of color, all of the contributions of people that represent the LGBTQ community and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, or people with disabilities, we would not be who we are as a nation. So why would we not make it our work to make sure that we are removing the barriers to anyone to be mm -hmm. able to fully contribute to our great society? Well said. Mm -hmm. How about you, Diane? Well, I think for the education communi educational community, it is imperative because education is the great equalizer. Sure. And then when you look at how that builds into community and economic development, we are kidding ourselves if we think there's not a connection. Mm -hmm. And if we don't find a way to embrace those who are different from ourselves, um, we are going to lose. Um, when you look at the demographics and the trends that are being predicted for 2045, we are going to be an increasingly diverse country, yeah. world <laughs> yeah. for that matter, and it is going to happen here in the local community. And the quicker we can make all people feel like they belong mm -hmm. and they're a part of what makes our community great, the better off we're going to be. And that's a good point you brought out about the, the, you know, the, the diverse mm -hmm. population of the country, our communities and all of that. So why is this such a hard concept to grasp? Fear. You know, with fear? Well, fear, uh, right? Because if you're going to get something, I'm losing something, right. right? It's that mindset of limits where I really think, <laughs> you know, anyone who's been a parent yeah. can understand that you have your first baby and then if you're foolish enough to have another <laughs> one, um, I can remember being so afraid, there is no way I'm going to love this next yeah. child as much as I love that first one. Yeah. And guess what? She was my favorite. Wow. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I, mean, I, think, I yeah. think community building's the same way. Sure. Well, people fear what they don't understand, mm -hmm. and I've often said that, you know, and uh, well, whose responsibility is it to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion? with the changing demographics and everything else? Is it, is it corporations? Is it community? Is it the young? Is it generational? Or uh, what, are your, what is your take on that? Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Pam. Well, based on my job, a lot of people think it's my job. <laughs> I, I can <laughs> say that I have been very fortunate um, under Dr. Gavin's leadership mm -hmm. to have him say, this is all of our work together, you know, Pam, there's no silver bullet sure. come here to <laughs> address all of our DEI woes, if you will. Um, so it's, it's, it's all of our work. It right. really is. Yeah. And right. I think that the, the, the work has to begin within yourself. A lot of times when people want me to come 
and do DEI training. They want me to teach them about all the others in the world. Yeah. And what I always say is, no, we have to kind of start with you. We have to start with unlearning behaviors, thoughts, um, practices mm -hmm. that um, may present challenges mm -hmm. for other people. So it's, it's, it's all of our work, even myself. I haven't arrived. Sure. I'm still working, working. on unlearning things <laughs> that I was socialized to mm -hmm. believe that are inappropriate. Yeah. And uh, any comments, uh, Diana? Would you like to chime in on that? Well, I think it is the responsibility of everyone. Um, as Pam mentioned, we need to look internally Organizationally, we need to all be very, um, when I use the word critical, I don't mean finding fault, but really looking at it mm -hmm. objectively mm -hmm. and open-minded with an open mind. And then I think we all have a responsibility how we're going to take that from our homes and our families and our workplaces into the greater community. Sure. And May being a lot of things, um, I, I, I was looking at just some historical on this day and of course, uh, I believe it was the civil rights starting in was in Birmingham on May 2nd. So everybody, when we talk civil rights and all, should have that equal opportunity, uh, equal rights uh, to just the basics, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I'm going to uh, share this with our, our viewing audience. When I first met Dr. Gavin, he came into town here, met with the NAACP and a lot of community partners and told us about uh, your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And from what I see, you're holding true to that, uh, that promise. And share with, me, with us in the audience some of the things that you have planned or some of the things that you've put into the works here at Delta College to continue to promote that and to stand by uh, that promise that you did make. Okay. So we've done, um, it's almost a combination of what Pam and Diane were talking about. Mm -hmm. One is the way that we're remaining critical, for instance, is mm -hmm. we're very data centric. Um, it's, it's incumbent, I think, on leadership at organizations to look mm -hmm. at data. Sure. And that tells you whether you're an organization that's promoting equity or not. The data should, not ha it should be disaggregated yeah. and look at the outcomes. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet sure. at Delta. And nobody else is either. Yeah. But that means that you need to have the bravery not from leadership all the way down to be critical about oneself, sure. what one's role is. Um, and that's both a head and a heart sure. kind of thing. Um, I, I, well, to, since you referenced me, I'll reference Renee Johnston, who said uh, at a meeting in Saginaw that stuck with me, this was a year and a half ago, something about thinking about love as a construct and thinking about the way that you can include people if you start from a place of love instead of something else. Sure. And I think that it, most of us can get there, right? If you really start to think about how we approach students, how we approach each other. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you can get away from the ego and all of that and start to think about how can I improve on trying to make sure that everybody has the same experience. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll, I'll um, close on this. We're, we're completing more students. Our enrollment's up by about 30%. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Um, it's our, we, our retention rate's up by 2.5%, which is a lot. Sure. Um, and we're closing our equity gaps because of the intentionality with data and subsequent action. Um, and when we talk about those numbers, what it really means is mm -hmm. there's people behind those numbers mm -hmm. and their successes, and that's the most important part. Um, and we are also, just since you asked, the, and I get, get to, to say, our, our faculty and staff are diversifying as well. And part of that is collaboration with Pam and I and people who work with us and for us to think about, have we done our job description right to show about the values that we're trying to take towards the future? Sure. Um, so we're, we're seeing a lot of success, but it's a lot of work, and it ha is incumbent on leadership to set the tone and use data to see where there are shortcomings. Great. Well said. And it starts with love, and I like that aspect. Any, any, any follow-up on that, Pam? I, I would just say um, Dr. Gavin created a bed eye framework, and it basically asks us to ask the right questions mm -hmm. of ourselves. We look at our employee data, our student data, um, incidents uh, that might be um, affected by unconscious or implicit bias, uh -huh. as, as well as our culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about wanting to create a sense of belonging for all of our students, but one of the things that I've been saying is we can't give to others that which we don't have. So it is important for all of us to feel like we belong here, we are valued here. 
so that we can be almost like this utopian microcosm <laughs> of what could be right. when people figure out how to live in, yeah. in, in that spirit of humanity and love, as sure. Dr. Gavin spoke of. And Dr. Gavin also mentioned numbers and, and research and data and those things that quantify what some of us already know and feel. So that's going to transition me into you, okay. Diane, and I understand you and the Bay Area Community Foundation commissioned a study, a, a DE and I study. How did that come about? Yep, so the diversity, equity, and inclusion report is specific to Bay County, mm -hmm. and it came um, shortly after the murder of George Floyd. Sure. And community foundations as a field, we were, at least when I was young and coming up in the field, it, we were indoctrinated in this belief that we need to remain neutral. Mm -hmm. And um, where we're at in society now, neutrality does not equal quietness. So, you know, there's that quote by Martin Luther King that I love that mm -hmm. we remember, I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> but um, what we remember most is the silence of our friends. Wow. So for Bay County, we did not have any data. We had nothing to benchmark on the state of relations, um, interpersonal relations in our mm -hmm. community. So that was why this uh, report was commissioned. Uh, we had, um, academic researchers that helped us on it, Dr. Ken Jolly and Dr. Evelyn Ravuri. And it was informed by the community. So members of the community and about 19 different organizations um, within Bay County. And what we are hoping is that the stuff that we've uncovered, there are some things we do well and there's some things that we have a lot of improvement um, that's needed. And we're hoping that that report will just provide a springboard for others to embrace this work. Well, this is absolutely wonderful. Were there any sh real shockers or any surprises to you uh, that stood out when the final product? Yeah, came? so I would say that there, we identified some key takeaways. And the one, there were a few that um, I think warrant some more research. And one of them was in education. So it was not a surprise to me Mm -hmm. that people of color are graduating at lower rates than their white counterparts. Um, that was not a surprise. What was a surprise to me was within the city of Bay City schools, mm -hmm. we have two high schools, we have Western and Central. Mm -hmm. Those of color are graduating at higher rates from Central High School than they are from Western. Wow. And when you start looking at the demographics of those schools, Central High School is by far more diverse. diverse than Western. So what I would like to think is that it's because there's more of a sense of inclusion, yeah. right? That, that we're embracing those who are different. That needs to be studied. I mean, we can't, we can't conclude that from the report, but it was fascinating to me. Well, well it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the Western campus and things out there because on uh, one of my other hats, I've had to address issues out mm -hmm. there, uh, racial issues and all, and having a conversation and have really try to persuade the school system and the board to put a person under the umbrella of diversity, equity, and inclusion to handle situations like that. Because the data and mm -hmm. those fi findings suggest that um, those where there is diversity or a person in that capacity to, to deal with those things and show that they care tend to do better. And I guess that's, that's a great finding. So where do you go from here? Well, so you mentioned schools and do they employ a diversity, equity, mm -hmm. and inclusion officer. And I will tell you that there are a lot of students that are leading the charge on this. Awesome. For example, within Bangor schools, a student group has formed that is a diversity, equity, and inclusion book club, right? Your students are going to lead the charge in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but the administration is very much in support of this work. We actually had a meeting yesterday mm. with the superintendent of the Intermediate School District and several of our local superintendents about the resources that they need to move, to move the, the philosophy of sure. inclusion and hearing everyone's voices forward. Th they're definitely committed. And being a proud graduate of Bay City Central, uh, <laughs> go Wolves, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, that diversity does, does help. Mm -hmm. And I know the Midland uh, County has put a person in yes. position and 
the young man is doing a, a very good job, and a lot of those issues have, have ceased to, to, well, at least they're being addressed in a way uh, to be handled. Now, you mentioned the young. Is this a generational thing? Or, uh, well, folks like myself, the older generation who grew up under Jim Crow and seen a lot of things change over time, um, is it the responsibility of the young or the old or a combination of both? I know that's kind of a, a question that answers itself, but Pam, what do you think about that? I, th I think I'll stick with it's, it's everyone's work. I mean, even if you think about the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and how youth were mobilized in that sure. movement and how seeing them involved um, pricked the consciousness of our entire nation, I think in the same way, um, we have to teach our children that they can be agents for, for positive change. I know when I was growing up, I'd never seen, I, I'd never seen, nor did I think I would see a black president. Uh -huh. But my two sons were born into that world. Right. So that is a possibility in, in their mind. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a fact. And so I do think that we have to empower our young people to be critical thinkers sure. um, as well as change agents. I, I want to say the one thing about the schools, though. The reason why the schools need so much work is that schools weren't built to promote DEI. Wow. In fact, they were built to do the opposite. They were the wow. great assimilator, if not equalizer, all the time. And so when you start thinking about shifting that, like not stripping people down mm -hmm. <laughs> and out yeah. pops an All-American, yeah. but really allowing people to come together and um, be their authentic selves, but yet also self-actualize through the educational process. That's a, that's a new way of thinking about how we do school. Sure. Dr. Gavin, would you like to chime in on any of that? Or? I, I agree 100% okay. with both, both Pam and Diane. I, I think the only, th I would build off of what you were saying too, I, I think that if you, get a, if you think about systems and structures rather than individuals, have been built in a way that um, marginalize. Mm -hmm. And they need to be reimagined, reconceived, not in terms of revolution, but leadership, to think about the ways in which those marginalizations have occurred mm -hmm. and not necessarily create an appendage to what already exists, but infiltrate and re, uh, readjust almost in a reciprocal way of which they, they've been, if people are going to be their authentic selves. Sure. We've, we've all been taught that, um, just to, to take a, uh, an academic point of view, we've been taught that certain identities, because of centuries of oppression, don't belong in schools. Wow. Shouldn't graduate yeah. at the same clip. But that tells you the kind of mindset, but also the structures and systems that have been built to marginalize mm -hmm. take that long to disengage if, if you don't have strong leadership. And sure. it's not just a matter of um, these making these buzzwords it's a, and putting on a diversity, equity, inclusion office. Mm -hmm. It has to be integrated throughout the entire structures and systems in order for those structures and systems to have different outcomes, sure. in my opinion. We have a few minutes left here. And I think about it as um, uh, Dr. McLean mentioned about education being the wasn't promote or at that time wasn't promoting diversity but and i and it takes me back to one of my sheroes which uh you know uh ruby bridges you know just the courage and the just the for someone that that young to have to endure that type of behavior or those types of things thrown at you then and i know you have an ally a colleague uh aaron kretzenberg mm -hmm. who's young who was mm -hmm. pretty in instrumental in sieving through all mm -hmm. of this data. So I agree that it's going to take an all hands on deck mm -hmm. approach. But when we look at this stuff and you talk about it and when folks say, oh, it's critical or it's germane, you know, when it comes to my mind, when you say critical, do people of non-color, or I guess say white, mm -hmm. majority white, look at stuff like this as part or being a derivative of like critical race theory, which that's such a big issue right now, which it shouldn't be, but uh, it is. Um, how do you feel about that? I'll start with you, Diane. As, sure. Yeah. So I think words have a lot of connotations mm -hmm. that maybe um, weren't intended. So when you hear the word critical, it's, to me, it's criticism, right? Like there's a very negative, but what we're talking about it with regard to this is 
you know, objective, right? Like you're, you're saying, is this really a sound decision? Mm -hmm. Is this sound education? Um, are we telling the whole story? Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. We're saying we're looking at everything very objectively and critically sure. and, and problem solving. I think um, as a white person, I am a female. Maybe one day we'll have a female president. That would be <laughs> wild, right? But <laughs> it's coming. Um, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> maybe yeah. one day. But, you know, as a woman who is white, you know, there's things that just just because we accept the idea that there is unconscious bias does not mean that I have gone out and sought to discriminate against anyone. Like, and we, we look at things so black and white. Mm -hmm. and, and by that I mean yes or no. And um, I think we need to embrace the gray and the uncertainty and the, the possibility of different viewpoints around the same information. Sure, we have about a minute. Any last words to our viewing audience on the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, whether it be in schools or, or in your community? With the, you know, uh, famous last words. Uh, I'd like to encourage people to think of uh, their work to champion DEI as a gift uh, to ourselves from ourselves awesome. because ultimately that's our job to figure out how to make this world more humane more inclusive more fair more just Good. and when we do that everyone has a chance of belonging and it benefits us all excellent famous last words we'll leave it there and thank you all for having the conversation on diversity equity and inclusion today on soul issue of the african-american perspective to read the Bay Area Community Foundation's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Report, visit their website. Well, that wraps up our 22nd season. Join us again in the fall as we begin our 23rd season. And remember to like and share and follow us on Facebook. And let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. To view past programs, visit our website. Until next time, I'm Darrell Newton for Soul Issue, African American Perspective. And remember, if it matters to you, it matters to us. And if it matters, it's a soul issue.